Jeremiah chapter number 25, and uh, tonight we're going to uh, complete our study in Jeremiah 25. Last week we began all with, uh, went all the way through uh, verse number 14, and uh, again I just want to look at a brief portion of verses 1 through 14 uh, to see again what this was about. Uh, if you'll remember, there was a very important prophecy in Jeremiah 25 in verse 11. The Bible says, this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So we spent a lot of time last week looking at why 70 years. And uh, we see that it's because the children of Israel and, the, and those of Judah had not allowed their land to rest. They had not followed God's plan uh, when it came to the Sabbath. And uh, God instituted the Sabbath not just to give the land rest, but to free His people from oppression and to help the poor, to help the needy. And so uh, there was a, a lot of reasons why God established the Sabbath. It was established as a sign between Him and His people. But remember what Jesus said, that uh, the Sabbath was created for man and not man for the Sabbath. And we spent a lot of time looking at that last week. In fact, let's just turn to one passage, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, just to again see... Uh, see that thought summarized. Look at 2 Chronicles 36. And look at verse number 15. The Bible says, And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by His messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because He had compassion on His people. Why did God send them warnings and preachers and His Word? He sent that to them because... He had compassion on them. He wanted them to turn from their wicked ways. He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised His words and misused His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people till there was no remedy. Therefore He brought upon them the king of the Chaldees. Again, that's Nebuchadnezzar. That's Babylon. The Chaldeans and the Babylonians. It's the same group. It's the same thing. He brought upon them the king of the Chaldees who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion. So God had compassion. He sent his preachers because he had compassion and they wouldn't listen to the servants, the prophets. So he said, okay, I'm going to send my servant Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had no compassion. Verse 17, upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill... The word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, those 70 years, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. All those Sabbaths that the land had missed and the people had missed, God said the land is going to enjoy her Sabbaths. So He said it's going to be 70 years that you're going to be carried away out of this land. And that's exactly what happened. Now I want to look at the end of this chapter. Go back to Jeremiah 25 please. And uh, we're going to read the entire chapter, but I want to focus in primarily on one thought tonight. Out of Jeremiah chapter 25 we left off in uh, verse uh, number 14. We finished with verse 14. Uh, in fact, go back to verse 12 again. It says, It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished. He said, After the king of Babylon has come and conquered many nations, and we're going to list some of those nations in a minute, he said, It shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon. He said, I'm going to use the king of Babylon to punish my people, to punish all these other nations, but then I am going to punish the king of Babylon. Notice, And that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon that land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all the nations. For many nations and great kings 
shall serve themselves of them also. And I will recompense them, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. Now notice what the Lord does. Again, Jeremiah's ministry primarily was to Judah. But he also had a ministry to many other countries. God sent Jeremiah to many other countries, telling them judgment is coming to you as well. In fact, we begin here, verse 15, we see the nations that God sends Jeremiah to. Look at verse 15. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. He said, I'm going to send you to all these nations and I want you to go to these nations, cause them to drink of the wine cup of, of my fury. I don't know if Jeremiah actually took a cup in symbolism and said, here, drink this because God's bringing judgment to you. Or if he just spoke the words and said, you're about to drink of the, the uh, wine cup of God's fury. I'm not sure. It says taken in his hand. So I assume he took an actual cup with him as a symbol to these nations to show them that they were about to drink of the fury of God. Verse 16, he said, go to these nations. Verse 16, and they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then took I the cup at the Lord's hand and made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord had sent me. To wit, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, the kings thereof, the princes thereof, to make them a desolation and astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. So we know he already went to Jerusalem multiple times. He went to the cities of Judah. He went to the kings and the people. And so most of the preaching we've read has been to Jerusalem and to Judah. But notice who else now he's going to. Verse 19, Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Remember that many people had run out of Judah into Egypt, depending on Pharaoh to protect them. They put themselves under the shadow of Pharaoh, and the Lord told them, he will not protect you. The best thing you can do is give yourself over to the king of Babylon. But many people ran to Egypt, and so Jeremiah sent to Pharaoh king of Egypt and his servants and his princes and all his people. Now notice, again, we're going to read a lengthy list of people here. And these are nations around the children of Israel and the children of Judah that Babylon conquers. Notice, all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines and Ashkelon and Azza and Ekron and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon. And all the kings of Tyrus, and all the kings of Zidon, and the kings of the isles, which are beyond the sea, Deed and Antima, and Buzz, and all that are in the utmost corners, and all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mingled people that dwell in the desert, and all the kings of Zimri, and all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of the Medes, and all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are upon the face of the earth, and the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Shishak's just another term for Babylon. He said, once all these kingdoms have been conquered, once all these kingdoms have uh, drunk of the wrath of God, Shishak will as well. Babylon will also face judgment. Verse 27, the Lord says, Therefore thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink ye, and be drunken, and spew, and fall, and rise no more because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be, if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ye shall certainly drink. For lo, now I want you to notice verse 29, and this is what I want most of our focus to be on tonight. Notice what he says, For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. Well, what city is that? That's Jerusalem. He said, I'm beginning to bring evil upon that city. Notice what he says next. And should ye be utterly unpunished? He said, I'm going to bring judgment against my own people. I'm going to bring judgment against my own city. Do you think you're going to escape? King of Egypt, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, do you think you're going to escape? If I'm going to punish Jerusalem, don't you think I'll punish you? If I'm going to pin and punish Jerusalem, you kings of Arabia, don't you think I'm going to punish you? If I'm going to punish Jerusalem, uh, king of Shishak, king of Babylon, king of the Chaldeans, don't you think I'm going to punish you? And that's exactly what happened. God used 
Babylon. Here he's called, verse 26, the king of Shishak. He uses him to accomplish his will. But after 70 years, Babylon also faces the judgment of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, speak to our hearts tonight. Teach us some things from your word. But Lord, above all, again, we ask you to help apply this to our lives. Holy Spirit of God, give us warnings. Give us encouragement. Whatever we need from your word tonight, may we listen readily. May we not be dull of hearing. May we receive the things we've heard. Help us to understand that these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Lord, help us to understand that this is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So he said, Jeremiah, I want you to go to all these countries. I want you to take that wine cup uh, out of, the, of my fury. Make them to drink, he said. And if they say we're not going to drink, they will drink. Whether they take of that cup or not, they are going to drink of this judgment. And he says, verse 29, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by, nine, by my name. And should ye be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. That phrase caught my eye in verse 29 when he said, I'm bringing evil on the city called by my name. Will you be unpunished? No, they won't be unpunished either. I want us to see this common theme throughout Scripture. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. You know, the Bible says there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, the good news for a child of God is there is no condemnation. We're never going to see the gates of hell. We're never going to spend one moment in hell. Jesus suffered it all for us. When He died on the old rugged cross, when He was buried, He rose again. He took our place. We're never going to face hell. Now, that being said, people sometimes will say about a church like ours, which is a Bible-preaching church, a church like ours that teaches what some would call easy believism. Do you know what easy believism is? It's what the Bible says you have to do to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Remember when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, what did Jesus say? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, what did the people have to do in Moses' day when he raised that brazen serpent up on a pole? What did they have to do to be completely and totally healed? What did they have to do? They just had to look. That's it. Look and live, my brother, live. Look to Jesus now and live. All they had to do was look. Now, those who didn't believe God's Word, and they said, that just seems too easy. That's too easy believism. I don't believe what God said. It's too easy. So I'm going to go to the doctor. You know what happened to those people? They died. You know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to promise God to be really good. And I'm going to turn my life around and hope God saves me. God said, that's not how I told you you could be saved. The way I told you you could be saved is look to my solution. Look and live. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. Folks, that's real salvation. Don't let anybody add anything to it. Satan is the one who adds to the gospel. He adds to salvation. Salvation is as simple as looking to God's remedy. That's Jesus Christ and the old rugged cross. Now when you preach that, because that's Bible, when you preach that, people will say things like this. Pastor, if you preach that people can be saved no matter what they've done and no matter what they do, they'll just live any old way they want to. Well again, let me just say this. If you've truly gotten saved, the Holy Spirit of God moved into your heart. And when He moved in, your want to change. Amen. That doesn't mean overnight that uh, everything outside, has, has, you've gotten your act together. In fact, there's not a person in this room who can say, I've got my 100% of my act together. No, God's still working on all of us. He's still working on us. But the fact is that if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God lives in you and your desires change. They change. All of a sudden, you don't fit the same way you used to fit into the world. Does that mean you'll never struggle with sin? No, there's a lot of Christians who still struggle with sin. But what I do want us to understand tonight is this. While there is no condemnation to those of us who are saved, there is chastisement. There is discipline. God loves His children. And because He loves His children, He will not let us get by with sin. He won't. 
He won't let you get by with a pattern of sin where you just continuously rebel against God. He won't let you do it. Because He's a loving Heavenly Father. He will correct us as His children. Remember what He said? He said, if I'm going to bring judgment to the city that's called by My name, don't think you other nations are going to escape. I mean, let's look at this theme here in a minute. Again, this is what we need to understand. As a child of God, I'm not going to go to hell for my sin. But if I continue in sin, I will be chastised by God. I will. You mark it down. You as a child of God, if you continue in sin, you will be chastised by God. Now, you won't lose your salvation. As some people have said, the largest church in our area, which is a phony church, I called the church one day. I'm talking about Southeast Christian, if anybody's wondering. And I called Southeast Christian and I said, uh, hey, I said, I want to know. Because there was a family that was uh, in my Sunday school class years ago. And they were going back and forth. And I told them, look, you don't need to go there. While they might have some warm, fuzzy sermons, their doctrine at its core is baptismal regeneration. Amen. They said, no, 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 they don't believe. I said, that's absolutely what they believe. I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call them. I'm going to call them. And ask what I need to do to be saved. And I'm going to get back with you. And that's exactly what I did. I called them up. And I didn't lie to them. I just simply said. The, and there was a secretary that answered. I said, ma'am. I said, I want to know. What do I need to do to be saved? To know I'm going to heaven? She said, hang on. She said, I'll put you through to one of the pastors. I spoke to Dave Kennedy. Who was a pastor at the time. I don't know if he still is or not. He got on the phone. I said, sir, I want to know. What do I need to do to go to heaven? He said, well, there's four things. I thought, oh. Maybe I'm all wrong. Maybe he's going to take me down the Romans road. He said, number one, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Folks, don't get too nervous about this. They are preaching false doctrine. Don't get too nervous just because it's a big church and a popular church. It doesn't make it a right church. Amen. Amen. I said, what do I need to do to be saved? Four things. Number one, you must believe Jesus is the Son of God. I said, oh, okay, I, I understand that. Yes, we do. Number two, you must have a repentant heart. Well, depending on what you mean by that, that is true. You need to turn to Jesus Christ for salvation. Then number three, he said, you must, what do you think he said? You must be baptized. He wasn't talking about the spiritual baptism. He was talking about getting dunked in the water. Folks, if the water can't remove the stench of our bodies, how in the world can it remove our sins? It can't remove our sins. And then he said, number four, he said, you must remain faithful. I said, wait a minute. You said I must remain faithful. I said, let me ask you a question. Are you saying I can lose my salvation? He said, well, let me say it this way. It's very difficult to lose your salvation, but not impossible. I said, well, then how much sin do you have to commit to be unfaithful? He said, well, we really don't know. He said, we're not sure if it's like Lot, who was, you know, five years or ten years, he was away from God and Sodom, and God dealt with him. We don't know at what point, but we do know you can lose it, we just don't know at what point. Folks, I'll tell you at what point you can lose your salvation if you can be lost because you're unfaithful. One sin. One. The Bible says in James 2.10, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You're going to tell me you've remained faithful and never sinned one time since you've been saved? No. Folks, that's heresy being taught. That's absolute heresy. So, listen, you cannot lose your salvation no matter what you do. You did not earn your salvation. And you don't keep your salvation. We're kept by the power of God. We're kept by the commitment Jesus made to us. By the way, be careful about this terminology that says somebody must make a commitment to Christ to be saved. The only commitment you make to Christ is your eternal destiny, your soul. Jesus made the commitment to you that if you'll call upon Him, He'll save you. That's the commitment that saves your soul. So you can't lose your salvation, but, but, God will chastise His people. He will discipline. I want you to see what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 17. The Bible says, for the time is come. That judgment must begin at the house of God. Well, who's he talking about? He's talking about believers. Judgment must begin here at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? We get chastised, but the lost get condemnation. 
We were condemned already before we got saved. This verse is saying judgment's coming to the house of God. God will deal with His children. God will discipline His children. You've heard the story. It's a good analogy of that. If a child's out playing with their friends and they're fighting and bickering, what do the parents do? They go, hey, knock it off. They hear it again. They go, hey, I said knock it off. They might even call them in and get their attention a few ways. And then eventually what do they do? They just say, look, you're not... You're not obeying. You're not doing what you should do. You just come on home. Folks, God does call Christians home sometimes early Amen. because of sin. Doesn't mean you're lost. But it does mean you can sin unto death physically. God will punish sin. Make no mistake about it. The wages of sin is still death. For a Christian, it's not condemnation, but it is chastisement sometimes. Look what it says. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? This ought to sober us into, think, into realizing the danger of sin. Verse 18. And if the righteous scarcely be saved. you see that? The righteous are scarcely saved. I'm righteous. You know why? Because of Jesus Christ. But I'm scarcely saved. I deserve hell. Just like every Christian, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, please. I want you to see what this scripture says, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Again, lest we think that because we're saved, sin is no big deal anymore. No, folks, sin is a big deal. And God will deal with us according to our sin. He will chastise us to get us back on the path of righteousness. And we're going to look at just a few passages that, that show this tonight. But we need to take sin seriously. We really do. We need to understand how deadly it is. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth because there was some wicked sin going on and they were just allowing it, winking at it. Verse 1, it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. And such fornication is it's not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, look at verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Was this man in 1 Corinthians 5 saved? He was saved. You know, I'll hear people say to me sometimes, they'll say, I'm concerned about someone, so I don't think they're saved because they still drink. I don't, I, I don't know if so-and-so is still saved because they still smoke. I don't know if so-and-so is saved because they still cuss. I don't know if so-and-so still is saved because they still, you fill in the blank. Folks, can a Christian still live in the flesh? Yeah. A Christian can live in the flesh. But they'll be chastised. A Christian can live in the flesh. But they won't be happy. A Christian can live in the flesh, but they will be disciplined by God. Notice about this man. He said, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. As I've said just this year, I've been in the hospital room of a few people who were dying from sin in the flesh. The sin had taken over their flesh. And I wouldn't even tonight begin to go into the details of that, but it's horrendous. But that the people were saved. When they died, they went to heaven. But the flesh was being destroyed because of sin. Notice, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Why? That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Look at 1 John chapter 5, please. Again, this is why we need to be warned about sin. Even as God's people, we have no condemnation in Jesus Christ. But there is chastisement. Just as a parent dutifully chastises and disciplines their child when their child gets out of line. Why? Because we want to get their attention to help them go down the right path. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. The Bible says, If any man see his brother 
Now, do you believe, if you read through 1 John, do you think he's just talking about your biological brother? No, he's talking about your spiritual brother. He's talking about the family of God. These are saved people. Notice what he says. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. There is a place which a child of God... Again, people say, well, if they're really saved, they won't do that. Folks, a saved person can live in the flesh. And notice what he says, though. A saved person can cross a line with God. Where God just says, come on home. Notice verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Look at Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. By the way, a lot of false doctrine is taught and preached by taking scriptures that were intended for believers and applying them to unbelievers. Now look at Hebrews 2, 1 through 3. The Bible says, therefore we... Now, who is he talking to? If you read back through this again, he's talking to believers. Notice what he says though, verse 1. We ought to give the more earnest, earnest heed to the things which we have heard. What things is he talking about? The Scripture. The Word of God. We should take heed to uh, the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. You know, it's easy to let things just slip. To just kind of forget what the Word of God says. It's easy to get immersed in the culture and just kind of let the Word slip out of your hands. Verse 2. For if the Word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we... Do you, do you think this person writing this... Now, there's, a, there's debate over who wrote Hebrews, who God used to write Hebrews. I think it was Paul. Don't know that for sure, but I believe it was Paul. How shall we... Do you, do you believe that who penned this down as a believer? I, I do. Absolutely, they are a believer. How shall we escape if we neglect... So great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. Does this say, uh, now, now people preach this, they say, listen, if you're lost and you neglect to get saved, you're not going to escape. Well, you can apply it that way perhaps, but that's not what this is saying. This is talking to believers. It's saying, how shall we believers escape if we neglect so great salvation? Have you ever given your children something and they neglected it? They didn't take care of it? They didn't use it appropriately or, or the way they should have? I, I've told you my stories before. I won't embarrass my kids again tonight. But you can neglect your salvation. I was visiting a man in the hospital today. Now, it's amazing. This, these notes were ready last Wednesday. I'm visiting a man in the hospital today. and He told me this. He said, you need to use your salvation. He said, I, I wasn't even mentioning anything about this. And he said to me, you need to use your salvation. If you don't use it, it's like God never gave it to you in the first place. What he was saying, and then he began to cry. He said, there's times in my life I didn't use my salvation. What, he, what was he saying? He was saying, I neglected my salvation. I was saved. I was headed for heaven, but I wasn't living like it. I was saved, headed for heaven, but I wasn't growing. I was neglecting what God had given me. A child of God can neglect that which God has been doing in them. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, please. Look at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28. Notice what the Bible says. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose he shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge. What are the next two words? His people. Is, is he talking about believers or unbelievers? He's talking about believers. The Lord shall judge His people. All my sins were paid for on the cross, Pastor. That's right. And there is no condemnation. You're never going to go to hell. But there is chastisement. 
There is. There's discipline. And God works much the way we do as, as parents. What do you do when your children get out of line? You speak to them. You try to get their attention. Hey, don't do that. Hey, don't go down that path. And if that doesn't work, you get more and more severe to get their attention. Notice verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Who's he talking to? I know Jonathan Edwards preached a great salvation message from that verse, but who's he talking to? Believers. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. How many of you had a parent when you grew up that you feared? Let me see. Anybody? Just a few? I did. I had a dad that I feared. I loved him too, but I feared him. When his head turned red, I knew I was in trouble. Dad's mad. Hey, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Again, does this mean we should always walk around God just like, oh, I can't ever do anything right because I'm just so afraid around God? No, but it does mean you ought to have that kind of respect for God. You ought to have that kind of respect knowing that He's your Heavenly Father, that He will chastise if needed. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, please, verse 5. Remember what Jeremiah preached? He said, listen, he said, if I'm bringing judgment against the city called by my own name, don't you think I'm going to bring judgment to these other cities as well? Absolutely. 1 Peter 4 says that, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if, if uh, we're scarcely saved, where, the, where do the ungodly and sinner appear? Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. The Bible says, Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Speaking of the children of God. My son, despise not that thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. Listen, it's better to get rebuked of God than to have to be chastened. It's better to have to come to a sermon and go, man, there's another thing again I need to work on. God, forgive me. It's better to do that than just to ignore what you've heard and then God has to deal with you to get your attention. So He says, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of Him. Don't get tired of God rebuking you. Don't get tired of it. Don't get tired of opening your Bible and getting corrected again. How many of you have ever felt that way? You open your Bible, you get corrected again. Well, you know what happens? We need correction all the time. We do. Children need it. So do adults. Just think of your car again driving down the road. You have to correct all the time. Well, what happens? You end up in the ditch. Don't get weary of God's chastening. Don't get faint when He rebukes you. Why? Because there's a motive behind His chastening and behind His rebuke. What's His motive? It's always love. It's always love for His children. Always. Now parents don't, human parents don't perfectly exemplify that, but God's motive is always love when He corrects. Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You know, I think it's God would rather put us through some tough times down here and chasten us down here and put us through the ringer down here so we can have more rewards for eternity up there. I believe that. Notice verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the, uh, the way, but let it rather be healed. Accept God's correction. Don't play around with sin. God won't allow you to do it. He won't. He, he won't allow you just to do it with no consequences. There will be consequences for a child of God who lives continually in sin. And it's because God loves us that He wants to establish His holiness in us. Go back to Jeremiah 25, please. We're going to finish the chapter. 
Jeremiah 25, verse 29, God sent Jeremiah to all these countries. He said, Lo, I begin to bring evil on the city which is called by my name. And should ye, ye other countries, ye other cities, be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words, and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter His voice from His holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon His habitation. He shall give a shout, as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth. For the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Howl, ye shepherds! And cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and ye shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherds shall have no way to flee, nor the principal of the flock to escape. The leaders aren't going to flee. They're not going to escape either. They're going to be judged as well. Verse 36, a voice of the cry of the shepherds and a howling of the principal of the flock shall be heard. For the Lord hath spoiled their pasture and the peaceable habitations are cut down because of the fierce anger of the Lord. He hath forsaken his covert as the lion for their land is desolate because of the fierceness of the oppressor and because of his fierce anger. Would you bow your heads? Hi everybody, this is Tim DeVries, pastor of Vision Valley Baptist Church in Mount Washington, Kentucky, and I want to thank you for watching our YouTube channel today. Our desire is that the world know Jesus Christ as Savior, and that in this generation, His people will be faithful, uh, courageous, bold witnesses for Him. I want to say to you, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God loves you and wants you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. In order to know for sure you're saved and that you're going to heaven, the Bible tells us we need to know, first of all, that we're all sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because of our sin, we don't measure up to God's glory. God is perfect. We are not. And sin keeps us out of heaven. Secondly, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. The Scripture says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Revelation 20.14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. And because of our sin, we don't deserve heaven. Unfortunately, we deserve a devil's hell. But the good news is this, that God loves us. And because He loves us, He made one way of salvation. It's not through a church. It's not through a religion. It's not through doing the best works you can do. The only way He made to get to heaven is through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And in Acts 4.12, the Scripture says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus came to this earth. He was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took our place on the old rugged cross. He was crucified, buried, and rose again to pay for our sins. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus today offers you a free gift. That gift is eternal life, heaven instead of hell. And if today you're willing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're willing to call on Him today to save you, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10.13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you call on the Lord Jesus Christ right now to be your Savior? If you will, He promised He would save you. Feel free to contact us with any questions. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. God bless you.